Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Epiphany Savior and King Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Christian friends, the text for today's meditation comes to us from Paul's second letter to his young friend Timothy, chapter 3, reading from verse 14 and reads as follows. But as for you, Paul's words to Timothy, as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of. Thus far the text. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our risen and ascended Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Did you see the light? Thursday, 5.05 p.m. Did you see the light? That bright and shining, iridescent light which overpowered, overshadowed, drove out any darkness whatsoever. It was here. I saw it. I witnessed it right out there in the parking lot. Did you see it? I did. <laughs> you see, here's what happens. Usually whenever I'm, you know, trying to get ready to preach on Sunday, thinking about, okay, what am I going to tell God's people in God's house on God's day? What I do is, you know, Sunday afternoon when everything's nice and quiet and calmed down from the events of the week, I say, okay, here's what I need to do. I'm going to look at the text from the Bible that I'm going to preach on the next Sunday. And, I, you know, I kind of let that percolate and ruminate and I ponder over what God is saying in his word. And so I knew after the holidays, Christmas and New Year's and all the excitement and joy that was filling our schedules, okay, now we're back into Epiphany back into kind of a regular cycle of the church year. What am I going to preach on? Well, wait a minute. I've been preaching on 2 Timothy, and I want to get through that last and final letter of the Apostle Paul. So I cracked open the Word of God and read through Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and then I began to ruminate. What in the world is God through inspiration saying to his people I mean it doesn't sound like a happy message or a joyful message if anything a message of fear of fright a message of concern and worry as a matter of fact listen to what Paul says chapter 3 of his letter Paul begins by saying but mark this there will be terrible times in the last days people will be lovers of themselves they will be lovers of money. They will be boastful, proud, abusive. They will be disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Notice all the uns. Let's go back and look at those. Ungrateful, in other words, they will be without grace. Unholy, in other words, holiness will not be a part of their life. They will not get into the Word of God. They will not pray to God Himself. The Holy Spirit will be void and absent from their life. They will have no faith whatsoever. They will be unholy, which means they will be without holiness. They'll be wicked, unloving without any love whatsoever, unforgiving, without any forgiveness whatsoever. You, you know, we see this in our everyday lives, don't we? We see people that are irritated and grouchy and angry all the time going down the road. We've probably all dealt with road rage, haven't we? You know, the guy that's tailgating us because we're not going fast enough and finally there comes a gap in the road. He's able to get around us to pass us and he gives us what? The little Hawaiian love wave as he goes by. He blows his horn, flashes his lights. That is unloving. It's not as though they're going down the road saying, peace, brother. People that are without love, slanderous, slanderous. What does the Eighth Commandment say? Speak well of them, defend them, and put the best construction on everything. Watch the news, read the paper, listen to the radio, get on the internet. How many times in all those news stories and news feeds do you hear the best construction not being put 
on the given situation. Slanderous, says the Apostle Paul, without control, brutal. Not lovers of the good. You know what happened to me last night? It was, it was, it was an eye-opener for me. You know, I was here at church all day, was busy all day long here at church, doing many and various church things, right? Pastoral things, getting ready for this afternoon or, you know, after church Bible study, going through the book of Judges. Yet again, finally, I go home. I sit down. My wife has prepared a wonderful dinner. We eat this, you know, pot roast and potatoes. And, oh, wow, it was great. I was full. And then we said, you know, hey, let's watch a movie. We're flipping through the channels and this one thing pops up. Wow, that looks really exciting, you know, kind of an action-filled movie and we turn it on. I'm not going to name the movie. I'm not going to name the stars. But basically the premise of the movie was this satanic force which had invaded the world and was overtaking and overpowering the world. And I watched that for about five minutes and said, no way. I'm not going to invite this filth into my home. I'm not going to invite this into my mind. And we turned it off and watched a documentary instead on Bigfoot. I thought it was interesting. My wife fell asleep. But it, it, just, it just struck me. Here we are, you know, how many people invite this filth into their home and they embrace it because they are not lovers of the good. And they say, well, you know, it's only a show, all right? It doesn't happen in real life. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. What does Paul tell us about in the Bible? We war not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, the principalities, the forces of this dark world. Satan uses these means very subtly and very deceptively to reach into the lives of people and draw them away from things that are good. You know, why not watch a movie like The Wizard of Oz? It's one of my favorite. Yeah. Not the kind of things we see today. Brutal and unloving. Treacherous, rash, conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That one really jumped out at me. Because I thought to myself, all the wickedness you see going on in the world today, all the evil and ungodly things that are happening in the world today, and suddenly it occurred to me, oh my gosh, what about Christian believers? How many times have I gone to people's houses and I've encouraged them, you know, come to church, bring your children to church. You know, they're families with little kids or teenage children. And I say, you know, your kids need to be in the house of God. They need to be in Sunday school. They need to be learning about Jesus Christ. Oh, no, pastor, we can't do that. that uh, we have ball practice. We've got to go to basketball camp or baseball camp or, or that's the only day we get to sleep in. It's about priorities. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You know, I'm going to put a little barb in this one, a little hook, a little thorn. You know, I'm not going to look at anybody because I don't want to make anybody in one person feel too guilty. But think about that. How many times have I invited people, you know, you really need to come to Bible class after church. That's part of your Sunday morning worship. Oh, pastor, we have a breakfast appointment that we've got to go to. Lovers of bacon and eggs rather than lovers of God. I hope to see a large crowd in Bible class today, okay? Have I sufficiently made you feel guilty? Huh? having a form of godliness but denying its power. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. In other words, those so-called Christian churches that corrupt the Word of God. I've mentioned it before, I mentioned it again today. More than once I've talked with pastors of other churches, other denominations, Lutheran pastors of other synods, and they have told me with their own mouth, they have sat there and told me, you know what, Jesus Christ is a, a great way to get to heaven, but there are other paths, other roads, other avenues, and I say, are you out of your mind? 
How can you stand before the people of God and tell them blatant lies? Jesus is quite clear. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Read it this afternoon. Don't take it from me. Take it from the mouth of Jesus himself. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. Christ is the only way to paradise. And yet there are some so-called churches today who say, well, you know what, we want to be loving, we want to be kind, we want to be all-inclusive, we want to say that everybody is on their own road, on their own path, they'll get to paradise. No, they won't. Not without Christ. Look at what Jesus says in the Bible. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do many mighty works and many mighty miracles in thy name? And according to the word of God, Jesus will say to them, away from me. Go away, away from me. I never knew you, says Jesus Christ. I was reading one paraphrase one time of Matthew chapter 25 where Jesus tells them, you know, those on the left who have not followed his word and his way, you read it in the NIV or the KJV, depart from me. And this one particular paraphrase, it translated that word of God where Jesus says to them, you can go to hell. That, my friends, is the stark choice we have when it comes to eternity. Heaven or hell, that's it. There's no in-between, there's no limbo, there's no happy little place where you can go if you almost kind of sort of made it. It's either heaven or hell. The joy, the assurance that we have as Christians is because of Christ on the cross, you and I get to go to heaven. Not because of what we have done, not because of how devout or devoted that we have been, but solely and completely through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ. I've talked to more than one Christian who has told me, you know, I say, hey, are you sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die? And they say, well, I sure hope so. And if I make it, you know what, if my spot is somewhere in the kitchen or out in the heaven, garage I'm okay with that friends that's not the way God is going to treat you in eternity can you imagine being invited to a dinner party by a dear friend and you go and you're anticipating enjoying the food and the fellowship and you get there and they invite you inside and say oh by the way we don't have enough room for you why don't you go sit out in the yard somewhere wouldn't you be offended by that I would Unless they let me into their garage and said, play with the tools, right? Yeah. <laughs> God is not going to treat you that way on the judgment day. Have no fear. You are God's precious child. When you walk through those pearly gates, God's going to put you at that place of honor, that place of joy, that place of happiness. He's not going to say, you know what, you don't matter. You're not as important as this person or this person or this person over here. No, you are of vital importance to God and God is going to give you his whole, his whole, his total, his complete attention. You are going to be his special guest. He's not going to shove you aside. That's the joy the confidence that you and I have as Christians that when we stand before the judgment throne of God we need not fear whatsoever because we don't even have to say a word Christ will do all the talking for us he is our advocate he is our mediator he is our go-between he will look at God the Father the very one who blessed him in today's gospel lesson this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and on that day when it comes your time to stand before the judgment throne of God, God once again is going to look at his son Jesus Christ and Jesus is going to look at you and look at his father and say, this one is mine. I died for this person. I gave my life for this individual. They are precious to me. And then he'll turn to you, he'll embrace you and he'll say, come on in. 
share my happiness. For a pastor, a priest, a so-called Christian preacher to spread any other message is of the devil. God through Christ has done it all. Having the form of godliness but denying its power. We don't deny its power. Paul says, have nothing to do with such people. Have nothing to do with such people. Don't listen to them. Don't try to adopt their methods or their mentality. Call it what it is, says Paul. Call a spade a spade and not a shovel. What you're saying, what you're doing, what you're preaching is wrong. It's of the devil. Friends, I meditated upon all of that during the week. I sat and I pondered and I mused and I struggled with the Word of God because, you know, like you, I watch the news, I listen to the radio, I read the paper, I get on the internet and see what's going on out there in the world, and I, I contemplated, you know, are these signs of the end times even now? Are we in the final days? I truly believe that we are. I truly believe that we are in the final days. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that the world could end today? Yes, it could. Yes. Could it mean that it's a hundred years from now? Yes. The, the, the thing that we need to concentrate on is that we live in a state of ever-ready preparation. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. What were they doing in the days of Noah? According to Jesus, they were getting married, they were being given in marriage, they were planting, they were harvesting. In other words, it was just, you know, same old, same old every day. And then the flood came. You might be out mowing your grass. You might be out trimming your hedges. You might be out playing golf. You might be in bed snoozing. And Christ will come. Be ready. And be prepared. But are these things an indicator that we are in the final days? I think you would agree with me if we look around the world today, we see all manner of wickedness going on, people that are prideful, people that are boastful, people that are arrogant, people that do not love, people that do not forgive, people whose entire world is centered upon themselves. They're the smartest, the brightest, the brilliant, the richest. Look at me, they say. Look at how good I am. And I was thinking about all this and I thought, is this yet another indication that we are in the final days? And I thought and I struggled and I read and I researched and suddenly it occurred to me. Quite frankly, on Thursday afternoon at 5.05 p.m., I stepped outside to have a cigarette and I know that's not a good thing to do, so don't remind me about it after church. But I was standing out there and I was, okay, what is God saying? What is God saying? And suddenly, like a blinding light, it occurred to me, this is the way it's always been. There's never been a point in human history where the church was not opposed. You know, a lot of times we, we, we like to recollect, right? We like to remember when and we hearken back to days gone by and we look at, you know, America, say for example, back in the 50s and we say, you know, that was America's golden age. That was the great time to be alive in America. What a fabulous time. God's houses were packed from wall to wall. Churches were being built right and left. There were religious broadcasts on the radio and the television. Billy Graham was just getting his start going worldwide with his crusades and we say what a what a golden time for the Christian church unless you were in China when Mao and his communist forces took over 
and arrested and eliminated all Christian churches there in China, putting Christian pastors and believers in prison, treating them horribly, executing them for their confession of faith. If you were an American Christian in 1950, yes and amen. If you were a Chinese Christian, pain and suffering and persecution. It's always been that way. I've often thought, you know, my grandfather, my grandfather Fisher, who I am named after, Edward, his name was Edward, my middle name is Edward. You know, he started into the ministry in 1892. 1892. One of the first Lutheran pastors in the great state of Florida. And he was pastor, in fact, he retired in 1955. That is a long ministry. And I thought, you know, he was preacher during the 30s. And I've often wondered, you know, I wonder what life was like. I wonder what being a pastor was like back in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. It seems like, you know, there were really no big controversies going on. Nothing bad was happening. Unless you were a Christian in Nazi Germany, where the Nazis came along and oppressed the Christian church. If you were a Christian, for example, I would encourage you today, Google the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Lutheran pastor in Nazi Germany that was executed by personal order of Heinrich Himmler. It's always been that way. Back in the 20s, you know, the roaring 20s, everything was great. We had won World War I. We had a period of national prosperity. Everything was hunky-dory here in America. People were making money hand over fist in the stock market. It was fabulous and fantastic. And this new technology was coming out called the automobile, right? You could buy a Model T Ford for as little as $260, and it would come in any color you wanted as long as it was black yeah you know the original model T you could get it in any color you wanted as long as it was green but Ford chose black because the paint dried faster 1920s everything was fabulous it was wonderful it was great to be an American great to be a Christian here in America large churches were being built in our major cities beautiful structures which stand to the glory of God even to this day it was fabulous and fantastic to be a Christian in the 1920s unless you happen to live in Russia 1918 the Tsar and all his family were executed and after the Russian Civil War ended in 1922, it became illegal against the law to worship Jesus in the USSR. Many Christians were hauled off to prison, sent to the gulags where they died horrible and miserable deaths. They were mistreated and abused, manhandled and eliminated. It's always been this way. Friends and fellow Christians, we could go back decade by decade, century by century, generation by generation, millennia by millennia. We just celebrated the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the Castle Church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And when he nailed those 95 theses to the Castle Church door, it's not because everything within the world was hunky-dory, was it? And it's not as though the powers that be at that time said, great idea, Martin Luther, we do need to reform. No, they wanted to burn him at the stake. Go back to 1000 AD with the Cadaver Senate. I encourage you to Google that this afternoon, the Cadaver Senate, where one pope condemned the previous pope and had him dug up and put him on trial and then had his bones scattered at the Tiber River there in Rome. But a faithful follower gathered his bones down the river so that when the pope who had condemned the former pope was finally deposed from the papal office, the next pope had that pope reinstated and buried. That was the state of the church at that time. persecution and corruption 
people who were proud, people who were arrogant and boastful, and not lovers of the good. It's always been that way. But the one thing that has remained steady, the one thing that has endured through all the chaos, the turmoil, the war, the suffering, the trial, the persecution, is the profound message of Jesus Christ. The gospel of our Savior and our Lord. The church has maintained through it all because of the promise of Jesus Christ. I will build my church, says Jesus. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. Friends and fellow Christians, I strongly believe that sometimes we become worried. We become frightened. We become fearful. We read the news, we watch the television, we listen to the radio, we hear all the news that's going on in the world today. We see how our Christian faith, our Christian beliefs, our, what we believe the Bible to be true, we see how that is maligned and manipulated and under attack. We see how our Savior is made to be the brunt of jokes and we ourselves are the punchlines. We tremble and worry and wonder, what is the future of the Christian church on earth? What will our children and our grandchildren inherit? Will they know the true word of God? Will they follow the one and only path to salvation? Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Because God is faithful to his word and he will not abandon his people. And they will, if we are faithful, if we do the very thing the Apostle Paul instructed Timothy to do. You know, you see all this stuff going on around you, Paul says to Timothy. Don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. Continue in the things that you have learned. In other words, keep on keeping on. Stay faithful. Stay true. Trust that God will keep his word and do the very thing that God has asked you to do. Spread his word faithfully to the world. Friends and fellow Christians, with that I say, Amen.